This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 974, recorded on January 12th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Still have trouble remembering it's 2023. <laughs> You'll have to, you have to script that, and I'm going to put in my script, hello, everyone, so I don't start mm-hmm. saying hello, everybody, or forgetting what I'm, you know, my opening line. <laughs> so. All right, Daniel, what's up today? Well, we have a lot, and I actually, two quotations, special treat today, maybe special treat, you y'all can tell me. Um, there is no such uncertainty as a sure thing. And that's Robert Burns, um, old Lang Syne, so people might remember um, Rabbi Burns. Um, But also, I am not a person of opinions because I feel the counter arguments too strongly. And that's Mary Shelley. Um, So right right up front, I wanted to acknowledge um, uh, how so many are having a, a tough time um, but wanted to take a moment to uh, specifically talk about physicians. So uh, recently, a few physicians have shared with me their their frustrations. Um, one drop, dropped the compliment after venting for a straight 10 minutes without interruption. You must be a real physician because you just let me vent for 10 minutes and did not interrupt me once. Um, <laughs> as we, uh, we heard from uh, our medical society here in New York, um, 62% of doctors reported suffering from burnout, up from 40% in 2018. So the majority of doctors uh, this last year have reported that they, they feel burnt out. Um, more disturbing to me as a separate report found that one in 10 physicians surveyed had considered or attempted suicide in the last year. So um, just, you know, listen, if you're having a tough time out there, you know, reach out. Uh, you know, a lot of us went into medicine. We want to be there to help people. So, you know, your colleagues are, are right there next to you. So if you're having a tough time, um, reach out. I know it's been a tough time. Um, yeah, things have changed quite a bit um, since I started to practice medicine, which is even not that long ago. All right, let's get right into Ebola, the Ebola outbreak, which erupted in Uganda that was recognized in September 2022, has uh, been officially declared over, officials said on Wednesday, Wednesday of this week on the 11th. Uh, The outbreak had spread to nine districts, including the capital, Kampala, uh, raising uh, fears of it snowballing across the East African region. Um, It was the worst Ebola outbreak in Uganda in more than two decades, uh, second deadliest in the country's history with 142 confirmed cases. Um, According to the World Health Organization, it takes 42 days, twice the maximum incubation period for an Ebola outbreak to be declared over. So no new cases were reported um, on Tuesday, the 42nd day, um, and there was a celebration um, back there in Uganda. All right. Polio. Um, I don't know if people who are watching or if, uh, Vincent, you recognize this as my polio bow tie. I do. Uh, The color. Yeah, I can tell. by Because I have a tie like that, actually. And see the Rotary International symbol there? I do, yeah. In fact, I have it right here. Let me get it. (laughs) This is great. Let me interrupt. So for those of you that are, are listening right now, Vincent has has left the the set. He, he's he's getting something. He's returning now. I, I feel like I'm a sportscaster. Yeah, um, we and now he is. C- <laughs> now, if we, if we were on CNN, we wouldn't be allowed to do that because they're on a tight schedule. But they wouldn't let you do that. And out it comes. You know. See, there it is. It's a regular tie. So Vincent, um, that's the same. That's my bow tie, but then I modified it. So very similar. I don't have a rotary on it though. Oh. But- yeah. You have the rotary that you got to pay part. extra. You got to pay extra. So sorry about so that. So this yeah. is, um, yeah, infectious aware- wearables, right? Is that what you got? Yeah, infectious wearables. So yeah. Yeah, we shop at the same place. Um, well, you know. I think someone gave it to me. Uh, <laughs> okay. I don't get... usually, you think it could go on this uh, turtleneck here? Would that work? Uh, yeah. Well, well while, while you do that, <laughs> let me start talking about polio. <laughs> Um, you know, I really want to keep polio on people's radar. And it's going to be on your radar, by the way. You're going to be hearing more stuff. Um, but a new batch of wastewater samples have turned up positive for polio in Orange County. 
um, did I pronounce that correctly? Orange, orange. The be, finding depends where you're from. Either way, <laughs> the finding comes after six weeks of negative results for the virus in wastewater testing throughout down, downstate New York. It's actually interesting if you look at the is this almost looks like a heat map of like red and positive and then negative and then you get the red again. Um, two wastewater samples were positive according to New York State Department of Health. One sample was collected from the Harriman Sewage Treatment Plant. One sample was collected from the Middletown Sewage Treatment Plant. Um, the strains in the two positive samples um, were genetically linked to a Rockland County case of paralytic polio discovered in July 2022. This is interesting because it's not clear where, you know, was this in someone who didn't I mean, didn't go to the bathroom for six weeks? No, that's not likely. But it's not a, it's not a reintroduction because it's linked to the case from July, right? So it's yeah. not a, another introduction from another. So it's it's something somehow some kind of circulation here that we just didn't see. Maybe someone visited this area, used the bathroom, and and that's it. I, very, very curious. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? They're genetically linked to the Rockland County case. So, yeah, it's sort of interesting. And, and I think another, you know, I was, I was chatting with Amy Rosenfeld today. Uh, I think you know Amy there, Vincent. She used to <laughs> work at Columbia. <laughs> do. And, uh, you know, just about, you know, do, we don't, really don't do a lot of surveillance here. And, and one of the, there's a public health benefit to surveillance I'm, on my soapbox here. Um, you know, a lot of times you have these conversations, but why am I bother vaccinating my children? Why are we getting vaccinated for polio? It's not even a thing. It is a thing. It's it's here. So, and I think that, um, you know, if this is, is out there, if people are aware, it helps us, helps us with our discussions, um, encouraging people to get that protection from vaccine. Well, these, yeah. these viruses that are in wastewater could paralyze you. They're revertance of the vaccine. They're not attenuated, so you should be vaccinated for sure. Um, influenza is a, is a little bit on the way down. I mean, it's still higher than it's been in several years, but um, that is leaving the opening here for COVID. Um, and I wanted to start by correcting um, a, a mistake I made last uh, last week, and I got lots of actually they were they were reasonably kind um, emails. Um, tweets, DMs, etc. So thank you. I, you know, actually that's one of the great things, right? Is is we we get a pretty pretty significant peer review here when whenever we say anything. Um, so so let me go back to what was the response. So Katie writes, I recently had COVID nineteen, and because I am breastfeeding, I was told by my GP's nurse that I should not take Paxlovid. I'm vaccinated and boosted, but no bivalent booster, and I don't have any um, risk factors. And then she goes on. Um, so I I had um, said okay. Okay, this is reasonable, but but let's actually go through um, because uh, I, she opens up a bigger question: is what about a high risk individual? You've got a high risk individual. Um, you know, is it is it safe? Is it okay? Are you told not to give Paxlovid during breastfeeding? Um, so I should have taken the time, and I'm going to acknowledge that I didn't take that moment to click on the FDA package insert to verify. Um, but if you look in section 8.2 under lactation, um, and I'm going to go through this because uh, I think this is a good chance for me to highlight that this is not a contraindication and that this is something that is a risk benefit in, in breastfeeding um, uh, when a person's breastfeeding. There are no available data on the presence of nermotrelvir in human or animal milk, the effects on the breastfed infant or the effects on milk production. A transient decrease in body weight was observed in the nursing offspring of rats administered nermotrelvir and they reference data. Um, limited published data reports that ritonavir is present in human milk. There's no information on the effects of ritonavir on the breastfed infant or the effects of the drug on milk production. Uh, the developmental and health benefits of breastfeeding should be considered along with the mother's clinical need for Paxlovid and any potential adverse effects on the breastfed infant um, from Paxlovid or from the underlying maternal condition. Um, breastfeeding individuals COVID-19 should follow practices according to clinical guidelines to avoid exposing the infant to COVID-19. Um, and then they mention the data, which is the pre and postnatal developmental study. Body weight decreases of up to 8% were observed in the offspring of pregnant rats administered nermotrelvir at maternal 
systemic exposure, approximately eight times higher than clinical exposures at the authorized human dose. No body weight changes in the offspring were noted at maternal systemic exposure, approximately five times higher than clinical exposures at the authorized human dose of Paxlovid. So um, I should also say that um, the American College of Gynecology, so ACOG, um, is also on board with um, the use of Paxlovid in high-risk individuals um, who are breastfeeding, uh, referencing these uh, same points. Um, so as a correction to my previous uh, comments, uh, it really is a risk-benefit consideration, and breastfeeding is not an absolute contraindication to use of Paxlovid. Okay. All right. Um, a compelling piece with lots of photos in the New York Times about what is happening in China with a focus on Shanghai. Um, what exactly is happening? Why are things so bad? I'll leave a link into, uh, into this article. Um, but I, I just think one of the challenges um, is that there were a lot of ideas. People had certain ideas about, about Omicron, and now it's it's so mild that this will be fine. Um, you know, lots of people can get infected. It's not going to be a problem. Um, and, and the other thing is going to be a challenge is we're probably not going to get the, the information on the ground. I mean, we hear stories of crematoriums going all the time. Um, we hear of, of places where people are buried, et cetera. Um, so, you know, just, just to sort of throw that out there. So the other topic um, that hit it's home on the growing evidence that SARS-CoV-2 is here to stay. Um, and so National Geographic did a nice piece. COVID-19 is more widespread in animals than we thought. Um, so far, the virus has been detected in more than 100 domestic cats and dogs, tigers, lions, gorillas, snow leopards, otters, spotted hyenas, a binturong, not sure what that is, a coati, where's Dixon when you need him, a cougar, a domestic ferret, a fishing cat, a lynx, a mandrill, a squirrel monkey, wild black-tailed marmosets, big hairy armadillos, a <laughs> leopard, as well as mink, mule deer, white-tailed deer. And we do not even do that much wild animal testing. So this is likely just the tip of the iceberg. All right. I always like to mention children are at risk from COVID and long COVID. Um, and a challenge, someone was asking me this recently. We used to get really good data on a, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, how many children are hospitalized, how many children are dying secondary to COVID. Um, we're not really getting great, great data there. So I just, just want to point that out. Um, but let's move right into the post-exposure period, the testing um, have a plan, right? We talk about this ahead of time. Um, talk to your provider. Um, you know, if you don't have a provider, we acknowledge that. Um, you know, we've talked about how um, some of the pharmacies have, have created options. Um, here in New York, there's actually a number you can call. Um, but what can we do to keep ourselves safe from any var variant under the sun? So non-pharmacal intervention. So masks protect you against every variant. Um, the science favors mask use and suggests a hierarchy with N95s offering the highest level of protection. Um, ventilation, um, almost a exclusively respiratory spread, so keep that HVAC fan turned on. Um, and let's talk about an article. I do not think there's any partisan divide um, on the topic of clean air. Um, maybe there is. Um, the article, Increasing Ventilation Reduces SARS-CoV-2 Airborne Transmission in Schools, a retrospective cohort study in Italy's Marche region. Am I doing that right? I think it's just Marsh. Marsh, okay, in the Marsh region, um, published in Frontiers in Public Health. Um, it's retrospective. Um, here they looked at more than 10,000 classrooms, of which 316 were equipped with mechanical ventilation. Uh, they used ordinary and logistic regression models to explore the relative risk associated with the exposure of students in classrooms. They reported that for classrooms equipped with mechanical ventilation systems, the relative risk of infection of students decreased at least by 74% compare with a classroom with only natural ventilation, reaching values of at least 80% for ventilation rates of greater than 10 L, and then they give some units of which I am not familiar. Um, from the regression analysis, they obtained a relative <laughs> risk reduction in the 12 to 15% for each additional unit of ventilation rate per person. And Daniel, that's 10 liters per second per student. <laughs> okay. All right. I actually am familiar with that, <laughs> leaders and students. So, and seconds, and seconds. 
All right. Um, so continuing on my theme of improved ventilation, um, the article, Use of Carbon Dioxide Monitoring to Assess Ventilation at a National Infectious Disease Conference, was published in Clinical Infectious Disease. Um, three of the authors carried around these handheld CO2 monitors, and as one might expect, there were high levels in rooms with greater than 90% of posted capacity. Um, I actually ordered one for myself, so I'm excited to start monitoring this. I actually ordered the one they used in the study, so this is going to be great. What are you going to do right. with this, Daniel? I'm going to monitor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll report back. I'm very excited. This will be another excuse for me to not have to eat in crowded restaurants. All right. People may have heard the report um, that COVID-19 environmental surveillance looking at wastewater from planes in Malaysia recorded 96.5% of samples were found to have the Omicron variant of SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, so very interesting to try to interpret this. Um, when we were told to take off those masks because they want to see our smiles, it uh, gives me a little pause, but let us, let's think about this more. Um, so we know that people um, continue to stay positive, often for weeks. Um, if this same result is found in one year or two years, how do we interpret this? Does this mean that 96% of planes have someone transmitting the virus? Um, as one colleague suggests, my buddy Jay Berger, um, perhaps this is an underestimate because how many people are even using the airplane lavatories for a long call instead of the before and after some of us prefer? So is 96% of people using the lavatory on the flight um, putting positive uh, in there? Um, what if we looked for flu or RSV or polio or dare I suggest we actually do some quantitative work? So um, I don't know. Did you run across this, Vincent? This is circulating in the mainstream yeah. media. Well, I think that just being positive isn't enough to be transmitting, right? So yeah, I'm not sure what to make of this. I mean, you can be you, know. you can be positive for weeks, but it may be at a level that you're not really infecting anyone. And what's on the airplane, you know, it, it doesn't have to be very much. And again, not low levels of virus. So I'm not so concerned about this, frankly. Yeah, it's hard hard to hard to make, but it does make but, for a great scary headline. <clears throat> But you're right. Let's look for some other viruses. We'll find them all. And then what, right? <laughs> then I'm, I'm never flying again, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. COVID active vaccination. So we've got a bunch here, which is which is great. Um, so more on boosters um, with the preprint effectiveness of the bivalent mRNA vaccine in preventing severe COVID-19 outcomes, an observational cohort study posted on the Lancet preprint server. Um, so this is data from the uh, Clalit Health Service. So as excited as we want to get all the qualifications, um, this is a retrospective observational cohort approach looking at Israel's largest state-mandated health service organization. Um, so let's start with the method. So um, these are the results of a retrospective cohort study that included all members of Clallet Health Services aged 65 and over eligible for, as they say, a bivalent booster. Um, but at this point, um, really many parts of the world, you could just say booster because that's the only option. Um, hospitalizations and deaths due to COVID-19 among participants who received the bivalent vaccine were compared with those who did not. Um, no placebo control. So we're, we're not going to, um, to basically um, get um, you know, compared to those um, that did not get a vaccine um, compared to three or four. A Cox proportional hazards regression model with time dependent covariables was used to estimate the association between the bivalent vaccine and COVID-19 outcomes while adjusting for demographic factors and coexisting illnesses. So what did they find? A total of 622,701 participants met the eligibility criteria of these 84,314. So 14%, only 14% received a bivalent booster during the 70 day um, study period. Uh, this is not a lot and probably rather similar to what we are seeing um, in the US. Um, hospitalizations due to COVID-19 occurred in six bivalent recipients, giving us an adjusted hazard ratio of 0 0.19. Death due to COVID-19 occurred in one bivalent recipient. So uh, for death, an adjusted hazard ratio of 0 0.14. So, so this is the headline we get. Based on this data, 
and the bivalent booster may be reducing progression to hospitalization by 81% and risk of death by 86%. So to be completely transparent, we're talking about a baseline risk of hospitalization in this study of 0.055% or 1 in 2,000, and this is people 65 and over, and the baseline risk of death without a booster of 0.01%, or one in 10,000. So the absolute risk is really small. I mean, we're talking about, you know, numbers needed to boost in the range of, of 2,000, maybe to prevent a hospitalization, um, mm -hmm. maybe in the range of 10,000 to prevent a death. Um, so, you know, when you look at the 81 and 86, you, you come like, oh my gosh, how can anyone not tell everyone to run out and get a booster when you see these numbers? But you've got to ask, I mean, start doing the math. If you're, you know, 10,000, um, you know, and this is two months, you know, protection at this point we're seeing for two months. And you could actually see, um, you know, this little sort of tail where things start to tail off a little. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So there are, uh, this tells me that not getting the booster is really good also, right? Because well, I guess what, what I'm going to say <laughs> is getting those three shots is really good. Yes. You know, people who got shots. three shots are really in, in a good place. Um, yeah. you know, and we're still, we're, we're recommending boosters for high risk individuals. Um, but I think you look at data like this and you, you know, when, when people start saying, you know, if you're 19 and you're fine and you had COVID and do you really need, you know, I think this gives us some sort of context for, you know, what, what, you know, you don't want to over promise with vaccinations. You don't want to over promise with the boost. You want to be honest about what you can be offering. The other, the other thing, Daniel, is, is as you said last week, we spent $5 billion on this bivalent booster. It may well be that if we still use the old booster, that would have had the same effect. We don't know that. We may have saved a lot of money. And this is 70 days. And as you say, it's beginning to tail off. Maybe in 140 days, there's no more protection than people who didn't get the booster. So I, I think you can't use this to, to say that a good strategy is to change the, the booster every six months or so. You know, it, this is a huge challenge, and it, it's not just a scientific challenge. There's, there's emotion here, right? I mean, there's, you know, are you an anti-vaxxer? Are you you're not, not sure. recommending that everyone gets you – know, it's a very sensitive topic. Um, and despite that, I think we do have to be honest to what the science is telling us. So it's going to be a meeting, right, later this month to talk yeah. about, you know, what happens next. Um, and I just think we have to be really honest about, you know, don't don't just throw out this 81 percent reduction, 86 percent. You know, you see that and you're like, oh, my gosh, wow. And then you're like, OK, what's the ax the actual um, mm -hmm. risk reduction, not the relative. So and now what about mucosal immunity? Um, so we, we haven't we've have we heard a lot about mucosal immunity? I think so. <laughs> um, so the article, seven-month duration of SARS-CoV-2 mucosal immunoglobulin A responses and protection was published in the Lancet Infectious Disease. Um, I do suggest spending some time on this, including the supplemental data. I actually spent quite a bit back and forth looking at supplemental data and the figures going from the text to the figures. Um, there's really a lot in here, but I found figure 1A the most interesting. Um, here they report the association between mucosal IgA concentrations at the 75th percentile or higher at enrollment. Um, they use the British here with only one L in enrollment. Um, a reduced risk of symptomatic BA.1, BA.2, or BA.5 breakthrough infection remained over an eight-month follow-up period with a hazard ratio of 0 0.55, um, really much due to this initial risk difference. So you can really see the, the, the lines separate, and then they sort of follow the same slope. This is for after infection because that's what gives you mucosal immunity, not vaccination. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. They have a lot, and this gets challenging when you're looking through the through the figures. And they do try to break this out with, you know, are is this coming from from you know. Uh, systemic IgA and then leaching across, is it being made locally? And there actually is some data that really supporting the idea that this is being made locally in mucosal surfaces, secondary to stimulation. So this is sort of a challenge. Like, how do you keep yourself from getting COVID? You get COVID. Um, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> so <laughs> just throwing that out there. What? Um, so what is the, the measurement here? This is so this is or disease or what? incidence of symptomatic BA1, BA2, okay. BA5, so symptomatic, um, yeah. And then they follow it over, um, over weeks. Well, as, as you know, the, uh, 
the challenge with these respiratory mucosal infections is <laughs> they're very quick and you don't get a great uh, mucosal response and it doesn't last for very long. And in fact, uh, they're so quick, they're in and out, they're transmitted and the, the immune response is lagging behind. So it's it be very challenging to ha vaccinate and, and solve that issue. Yeah, no, I think that uh, I, I was listening to the, the Amy and Vince in Q&A last night while, while driving to uh, see my son um, <laughs> compete in his uh, indoor track meet. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I <laughs> mentioned that, you know, Amy and I had talked about this a really long time ago. This is, uh, I think this is you know, interesting. The recently was an article by three eminent older yeah. white male um, you know, anyway, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, this is a, this is a basic clear challenge. It'd be interesting to see if it's something that we can uh, figure out how to get past. I mean, you know, I sort of joke like, Hey, the rate to keep from getting COVID is to get COVID. Um, but maybe there's some way to induce this, this mucosal protection for some reasonable period of time. Um, and then actually not get COVID by not getting COVID. So, um, all right, moving into the COVID early viral upper respiratory non-hypoxic phase. Um, you know, number one is still Paxlovid. At some point, I'm going to stop mentioning this by name. Hopefully, people will, will get this in. Uh, what does it take, five times or 50? Um, but little news on this front. Walgreens launches the free Paxlovid delivery services with DoorDash. And Uber Convenience <laughs> ensures greater COVID-19 treatment access to all Americans this winter. So I think this was announced a little bit back. Back, but I, I just ran across this. So, you know, I'm waiting to open up my DoorDash app and have, you know, a, a I might have COVID choice in the title. I, I think this is actually going to be go to the Walgreens and then they're going to they're going to coordinate with the others here. Um, and hopefully they're going to train the DoorDash and Uber convenience folks to uh, to drop off that Paxlovid and run away so that they don't end up getting COVID. <laughs> Um, all right. If you can't get Paxlovid, number two is that early three-day um, remdesivir. Um, and then we really are limited um, malnupiravir uh, last and least. Um, and then let's not do anything harmful. I had a gentleman recently um, in the hospital. This was his third bout of COVID. I was trying to figure out, like, so you had it the first time early on. You did okay. You had the second time. You did it. You're fine. Um, what happened this time? And he said, well, you know what? This time... I um, called up my primary doctor. I told him I felt like I was, you know, uh, coming down with something. I told him I had a COVID test, and he called in a medral dose pack. And I'm like, okay, now I understand why I'm seeing you in the hospital, okay? Um, so let's not do that, <laughs> okay? Um, COVID early inflammatory lower respiratory hypoxic phase. Um, I know, Vincent, if you remember when we talked about the data on sabizabulin, mm -hmm. um, well, on January 10th, um, Veru announced the appointment of Dr. David D. Ho as chairman of the Infectious Disease Scientific Advisory Board. So as uh, COVID is here to stay and we are seeing close to 3,000 deaths each week, it'll be interesting to see if this microtubule disruptor ends up in our toolbox for COVID-19. Um, currently, we're still um, using steroids, um, anticoagulation, pulmonary support, remdesivir in the first 10 days, immune modulation. Um, I mentioned that tocilizumab now is FDA approved for this indication, so um, please update those um, electronic uh, systems. Uh, it's not EUA. You don't have to fill out all those forms, so thank you. Um, and all right, moving into COVID, the late phase, long COVID. So the article, Long COVID Outcomes at One Year After Mild SARS-CoV-2 Infection Nationwide Cohort Study was published in the BMJ. Um, it would be a little critical of how the media is covering this, but let's, let's actually talk about what this study um, has to say or shows us. So these are the results of a retrospective nationwide cohort study that used electronic medical records from Israeli nationwide healthcare organization. Um, this study was performed to determine the clinical sequelae of long COVID for a year after infection in patients with mild disease and to evaluate its association with age, sex, SARS-CoV-2 variants, and vaccination status. Uh, COVID-19 infection was significantly associated with increased risks in early and late periods for anosmia, um, dysgeusia, it had a hazard ratio of 4.59, pretty high, cognitive impairment, 1.85, 
dyspnea, 1.79, weakness, 1.78, palpitations, 1.49. Um, now, hair loss, chest pain, cough, myalgia, and respiratory disorders were significantly increased um, during the early phase. Now, the spin is mainly positive, and I think that's consistent with other studies um, with what we're seeing, but unfortunately, not for everyone and not for all the issues. So um, they have a nice figure where they actually look through um, some of the complaints. So, you know, as far as losing your sense of smell, as far as things uh, not tasting right, um, you know, most people, that's that's getting better. As far as chest pain, actually, by 12 months out, um, the incidence of that report is, is very similar to baseline. Um, but some things, for instance, so um, weakness, right? That continues to be um, elevated hazard ratio. It really seems like it gets better and then comes back. Unfortunately, we see that. Um, cognitive um, impairment, so, you know, memory impairment, concentration. Um, again, we see that that persisting out over time. So some things get better. I think the, the spin on this was most people are going to be better at a year. That's true. 95% of people are going to be better at a year. Um, but you still have that chunk of um, individuals that continue to suffer, and that's real. Um, and so I was going to tell a, a brief little story that, that was sort of poignant this week. Um, you know, I still have a few patients that um, got sick early on, so March 2020, and still continue to struggle struggle with, with long COVID. Um, and so this is a healthcare professional I've been taking care of. Hadn't been able to see me for a few months because of some health insurance issues. Um, so it was nice to check up on them again. Um, when we last had talked, they were kind of in a dark place, but they were doing quite a bit better. Um, but they were fairly emotionally labile. Um, you know, and so I was talking to them a little bit about, you know, whether or not they were emotionally labile, you know, always, whether it was just that when something was upsetting, they were just you know, more easy, easily brought to tears. Um, so I suggested that they watch the, um, the the movie Old Yeller. I don't know if you're familiar with Old Yeller. I figured <laughs> this is a good one. Find out if they cry at the right times. Um, and, you know, and, and of course, I, I, a little, I told them a little spoiler alert at the end, the dog, you know, gets rabies and has to be shot. Um, and she said, that's okay. It's not a spoiler. I won't remember. <laughs> I said, well, then you might want to write down the, the movie because I don't think you're going to remember the name of the movie. Um, and at the end, um, before I said goodbye, I said, do you remember the name of the movie? She said, oh, yes, Big Yellow. And I Big said, Yellow. Yeah. Very good. Look at your sheet of paper. <laughs> and today she just texted me, you know, I'm not sure if I want to watch that movie. I hear they shoot the dog at the end. <laughs> so, you know, a little bit of joking here, but just to really point out here, here's a high functioning individual, a healthcare professional who now almost three years later is having the cognitive impairment that I just described. So not everyone gets better. Daniel, um, is there a, any association with first infections, vaccination, uh, and, and, you know, do we see a, a difference in, in these rates? Speaking in general, you know, sort of pulling together what we know, um, we do know that individuals that get um, COVID after vaccination mm -hmm. are less likely to get long COVID. So that's that's very reassuring. Um, individuals that get vaccinated after they start to develop long COVID have shown a reduction in the development of long COVID or the persistence of long COVID. Um, so that's actually one of the first things we'll do is right. ask someone, have you been vaccinated? If they've not, mm -hmm. we'll recommend they go ahead. Interesting enough, and this is a little bit of a challenge, the sooner after the infection you get that vaccination, if you're unvaccinated, um, the more effective it seems to be as far as reducing your long COVID symptoms. Do but we know if Paxlovid has any impact on long COVID? You know, we talked about one study may, a suggestion that there might be there might be about a 25 percent reduction. But we don't know. And I, I think okay. that's an important thing for us to follow and know. I mean, that would be a pretty reasonable indication if we anything we can do to prevent the millions of individuals that end up suffering post COVID. So at this point, we don't know. That's not an indication um, for Paxlovid. We'll see if it ends up being an indication. Well, one more question. This came up on the, on the live stream the last two weeks. So there's a, a certain risk of myocarditis in young men with mRNA vaccines. If you get boosters, does the risk, is it cumulative or additive or what? What With each boost, is it the same amount of risk? 
Yeah, it seems to peak after that second, um, well, okay. it seems to peak with the second dose. So it's not okay. cumulative, right? So we, we tend to not see it that much after the, well, with the first dose, we tend to see the peak um, with the second dose. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's interesting. We, we see a lower rate at the third dose, but there's also a selection are people who had um, issues with the second vaccine, are they just not getting that third yeah. and sort of removing themselves? Sure. Okay, thank you. All right, and let us finish off with low middle income countries. I, I like to remind everyone, no one is safe until everyone is safe. This has repeatedly been something we see. Um, and I do want everyone to pause the recording right here, go to parasiteswithoutborders.com and click donate. Um, even a small amount helps. Um, and during the, well, we're, we're getting down to the end here. So for the rest of January, donations made to Parasites Without Borders will be matched and doubled up to a potential maximum donation of $40,000 from PWB to microbe.tv, where maybe we'll print up one of those big checks, you know, Vincent, that you can, you know, carry yeah, to that'd be cool. bank. And <laughs> yeah, if we take a picture, we'll send it to the New York Times. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, um, so, so in these final weeks, if you would like a copy of Principles of Virology autographed by all the authors, all five authors, if you, if you donate $5,000 or more to, to Daniel's campaign, Parasites Without Borders, com will give you one of those books, okay? So just um, shoot me an email if you do that, vincent at microbe.tv. And now it is time for your questions for Daniel. You can send them to daniel at microbe.tv. Taryn writes, should I get a second MMR dose for my toddler? We live in the U.S., but not in Ohio. Still wondering what you think. Also, do you have any knowledge as to how many of the children hospitalized with measles have had only one shot? I've seen uh, data on the number infected with only one dose, but not the number hospitalized. Yeah, interesting. So, um, yeah, as people are aware, we um, had a pretty significant uh, measles outbreak in Ohio. A uh, number of uh, children ended up in the hospital. Um, you know, we're basically, you know, are, should you be getting, and I think the question is here, in addition to the normal MMR routine, should, should people be getting an, an extra dose? Um, and I think there's also coming up, there was a recent PNAS article about, you know, waning mumps um, protection. You know, should we be doing, mm. you know, an additional dose in that? Um, so at this point, there, there isn't a, a wide, you know, wouldn't be a widespread recommendation um, for you up there in, in Canada. Is it where it is? I didn't um, say. Yeah, but in um, the U.S., somewhere in the U.S., but not Ohio. The US. But, uh, yeah, so we're not we're not making this as a general across the board. Everyone, you know, uh, get get another shot. Uh, this really was a, an outbreak triggered by people um, being uh, not adequately vaccinated. Peter writes, "I just received my fifth COVID vaccine. I noticed on the insert it says effective in preventing COVID." And that's from the CDC Moderna fact sheet. Your team has always suggested otherwise. It doesn't prevent infection. It prevents hospitalization and death. What's wrong here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something's wrong there. You know, it's a pretty high bar, this, this whole idea. And we keep bringing this up, um, you know, the fact that for – pathogens that are, that are, you know, really basically stay outside the body, right? I mean, they're, they're in the lungs, uh, pathogens that are, that are on mucosal surfaces, uh, triggering these responses that don't have viremic stages, um, that have a really short incubation period, that it's really hard to maintain for any period of time protection against infection. I mean, there is, as we saw, for a transient period of time, you're going to get a reduction in infection. Um, you know, and we, we were, may, well, we were not, but people were a little bit too uh, uh, sloppy with their language early on. So, so think of the vaccines. Uh, the main thing they're doing is they're preventing disease um, as opposed to infection. And se severe disease and death, right, mainly? That's the main, I mean, that's the main protection. Yeah. That's, that's actually the durability the durable impact that we're seeing. Um, and as we talked about, we don't just, we mean, well, we mean death, we mean hospitalization, and we actually mean long COVID. Yeah. Leona writes, you have quite a following in Southern Oregon. I'm sure, I'm certain it makes a difference in the care of our community. I was recently asked if vaccines contribute to the development of new variants of, of SARS-CoV-2. It seems this has been in the news recently. What's your understanding of the impact of vaccines and the formation of new variants? 
Yeah. So this this is actually I mean it's a great question and and this is where you know words matter how you say this because there's this whole movement out there that you know the only reason we have variants or we have variants is because of vaccines and and Vincent and I have talked about this quite a bit so Vincent you're gonna hopefully jump in on this but the whole idea is that viruses change over time that that's intrinsic to viruses so they, they love to have these uh, you know quotations or these titles where they talk about, you know, mutating viruses. Viruses mutate. That's the deal. Um, but what they're doing is they're mutating um, to have whatever fitness advantage is required um, under that selective pressure. So here in the United States, 97% of individuals have some level of immunity. So the big pressure here is for immune evasion. Now, go to a place like China that we've discussed where there's not a lot of um, immunity in the population. So there's less pressure there for the immune um, evasion. Um, so there are going to be different pressures there. So there's always going to be different variants. There's always going to be different pressures. So in a vaccinated and a previously infected population, um, the fitness pressure um, driving those variants is for immune evasion. It's not for more serious disease. It's not for milder disease. It's for something that makes the virus more fit. So I don't know, Vincent, if you had any comments. I think any kind of immunity will select... Uh, an evasive variant, right? And it does. It could be vaccine or it could be natural infection. In the, in the U.S., over 90 percent of people have some kind of immunity from vaccination or infected. That's going to select for variants, right? It's not just vaccination that does it, as, as you said. Yeah. And there's nothing. Yeah, I think that's interesting. There's sort of this special idea that when people bring this up, oh, if we all just got infected, there'd be no problem. I immunity is, no. is, is roughly <laughs> immunity. Immunity yes. puts this pressure. So, yeah. Ruth, one Ruthie writes, I'm a public health nurse, so immunizations and education about those is my job. I was listening to a podcast with Dr. Stanley Plotkin. He said something I don't understand, or maybe I misunderstood. He said that mRNA vaccines don't stimulate very good long-term protection, so that needs to be worked on. My impression was that antibodies wane with time, but we still have fairly good protection against serious disease. I also thought there wasn't much research on B and T cell responses to COVID vaccines. What am I missing? I want to make sure I'm sharing correct information. Yeah. So this this is good, Vince. I'm going to ask you to jump in and, and fact check what I have to say here. So there's this whole idea that, you know, we've talked about, you know, I joke that Amy and I discussed this back when we were in preschool together, that infections that are mucosal, that don't have viremic stage, that have short incubation periods, um, that it's going to be pretty hard um, to develop a durable protection against infection, right? Um, we've also talked about the fact that antibodies contract over time. That's what happens. So there's suddenly this idea where people are putting these two together and saying, oh, you know, it's all because of mRNA vaccines. Antibodies don't contract um, more quickly after an mRNA vaccine, after maybe, say, a Novavax, right, a, a mm -hmm. protein-based um, vaccine. Antibodies contract at a certain rate. So a lot of people are throwing this out. They're saying the problems we're seeing with COVID, the problems we're seeing with infections like this, without a viremic stage, with a short incubation period, it's all because we're using mRNA vaccines. And if we only used a more traditional vaccine, we'd have more durable protection. Um, I don't think that's the case. I don't think this is something intrinsic to mRNA vaccines. But Vincent? So, you know, I think... Um long-term protection. So far, we the vaccines are working well against severe disease. We don't know how long that's going to last, right? It probably won't last 40 years like polio virus and measles and smallpox, but it's already gone a couple of years, so it's not bad, but how much longer? And I don't know that Plotkin knows, nobody knows how long it's going to be. So we, we just have to yeah. see. But so far, you know, you're that, right. We yeah. do have protection against severe disease, um, and I don't know how long that's going to last. Right. Yeah. And actually, that's I mean, it's a good point sort of that you, you bring up there, Vincent, is like so when they say, you know, it doesn't provide long term protection. But it actually I mean, as we've shown repeatedly and we think we just saw in another study, even people that didn't get that booster, um, the these vaccines are providing, well, pretty significant, pretty well to point durable immunity up to now against severe disease, against death, against hospitalizations. Um, are they able to keep antibodies at a high level? No, that's that's just not what antibodies do. So I'm not sure there's really any validity to to what he's saying um, about mRNA vaccines. I also think that long term, and it depends what you mean by long term. It could be 30 or 40 years. Well, we have no idea. We're not there yet. We're only at three years. I don't think three years is long term, Daniel. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, now that you're 70, you know the the metric of long term changes. That's right. Really 
And <laughs> by the way, uh, there is a lot of research on B and T cell responses to the vaccines. In fact, we're going to have Daniela Weisskopf on TWIV tomorrow, and she uh, works at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology and uh, works on T cells. So we'll hear more from her. Now, does she work there or they all surf? I think they all surf. And that's where I learned to surf at La Jolla. So hopefully we'll hear that she's... <laughs> well, she publishes a lot, so I think she does some <laughs> okay. work. All okay, right, our so last one is from... Watches everyone else surf. <laughs> <laughs> Watch, this last one is from Judy. My mom is in long-term care with dementia. No other underlying health conditions besides beginnings of dysphagia. She's 88. I did what you suggested. I contacted her doctor and pharmacist to come up with an action plan. She's fully vaccinated. Her pharmacist said she qualifies for Paxlovid. However, the challenge is Paxlovid shouldn't be crushed, and this is how her medications are administered. Just wondering if crushing them would be beneficial, or what would you suggest our plan B should be? Yeah, so I, this this has come up before, actually, and I think um, this was sort of was a question that was asked, a very similar question on the, one of the Friday TWIV deep dives about can you crush Paxlovid, and and in the packet, you know, in the EUA, in the package insert, et cetera, here, um, it's really an EUA FDA document. Um, they say do not crush. Um, and then they don't tell you why. It'd be nice if they told you why. Is it because it's intercoded? Is it because they're using this new nanoparticle technology? Um, they don't really actually tell us. But um, basically, the package insert is, is do not crush. They don't tell us why. Um, so, yeah, crushing Paxlovid is not recommended. Um, unreliable serum levels if you do that. So if you cannot swallow the, the Paxlovid pills, um, then what you're going to want to do is move on to number two, which is going to be your remdesivir option. Okay, remdesivir intravenous, right? Yes. Yep. Three days, just three days. Uh, Ju Judy says, love your bow ties. That's TWIV Weekly Clinical Update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, be safe. <laughs>